Welcome back. Last time I promised that we would figure out a way to solve those very nonlinear equations. And I'd like to do it with a sequence of drawings, of which this is the first one. And uh, please uh, appreciate that this is a simplified navigation problem that will work here. And the uh, simplifying assumption is that we're only trying to find our location east-west. So once we master that, we'll discover it's not that difficult to generalize to three dimensions of navigation, where into the plane of the screen would be north-south, and up, of course, would be perpendicular up from the east-west north-south plane. And the trick is all here. It's, it's, uh, it's shown here. We have a satellite in the sky here, in the western sky, apparently, and we have a ship here. <clears throat> and it looks like a modestly sized tanker with a single stack. And we're trying to figure out where it is east-west. If you like, imagine that the ship is in a channel and we're just trying to figure out how far into the channel it's gone. What we do, it's very straightforward, is rather than trying to solve globally for our location in a single shot, we're going to assume that we know something about where we are. And that's the so-called assumed location right there. So where might you get that? Um, if yesterday you were in Prince William Sound, you might just assume that your location today is in the middle of the sound. If yesterday you were in the Yellow Sea, same thing. If yesterday you were in the North Sea, same thing. And so we'll call that assumed location XU practically identical to our notation for the estimanda, which is shown here. XU is what we would like to know except for we add comma zero, or we would say x u naught. And that means that the components are x u naught, y u naught, z u naught. If you like, you can add b u naught and b u up here. It doesn't make much difference. The important thing is that we can really assume any location we like, hopefully one that's fairly close by, and convert our problem for one of being solving for x u directly, but rather let's solve for the error in our assumption, and that's delta x u. It makes all the difference. It really, really helps with our problem. You might say, well, what, what, what if your assumed location is lousy or you're way off? What we would do in that case is do this algorithm with multiple steps, multiple iterations. We would assume some location, do our best to calculate the true location. Being wary that our assumption in the first place might have been very wrong, we would then take that true location as calculated, treat it as the new assumed location, and then just repeat and repeat and repeat. And typically, GPS receivers can figure out their location worldwide, even if they have no really good estimate of their assumed location in only three or four such iterations. So it's very quick. So to repeat what's important, what we're going to do is assume a location. The true location is equal to that assumption plus some delta x u. And now we're going to direct our energy at estimating delta x u, not the whole x u, being mindful that if we can get a good estimate of delta x u, we're just going to add it to this assumption we made, and then we'll have our whole value of the true location. That's the strategy. Based on this strategy, we can go forward and begin to explode the problem even more. Remember, this is the true location over here. Here's assumed. And we can draw the ray from the satellite to both of those locations. And the satellite is 20,000 kilometers away. So by the time those two rays come down into our ballpark here, be it true or assumed, they're more or less parallel. They're just coming down next to each other. 
We make the measurement, the pseudo range measurement. We use our traditional notation for that, tau sub u super k. And that's the corrected pseudo range measurement that I so showed you in the last snippet. It's inclusive of the true distance plus the user clock offset. And by true distance, I mean just that. It's the distance from the true location of the satellite to the true location of the ship. Because we haven't uh, diluted this measurement with any assumptions or any data in the navigation message. This is just the travel time measurement. How long does it take to get from the satellite to us? In parallel, we're going to construct a range measurement. We're going to call it the assumed range. And what we do in that case is we just compute the Euclidean distance between the broadcast location of the satellite, so not the true location of the satellite, but rather the broadcast location of the satellite and our assumed location. We appreciate that both of those are in some error. The error in our assumed location is by construction. We know we just assume something close by, but not perfectly at our true location. And we know that by constructing a range measurement like this, we're including whatever error there is in the navigation's message description of the satellite ephemeris. So we denote that by d assumed, that's the a there, to the kth satellite according to its broadcast. So that's what our notation means in the two cases. Please know, of course, that dA super kb differs from du super k. du super k is the true distance, and dA super k comma b is a constructed one. It's close by. What we're going to do, looking forward into this, is we're going to take the measurement on the one hand, that comes from the radio receiver, we're going to take the construction, on the other hand, based on our assumptions, and we're going to do nothing more elaborate than subtract the two. And if you look at our drawing, you can already begin to see where that leads us, because the difference in their lengths can be seen by drawing this perpendicular here, and it is this chunk that is the difference in their two lengths. And you say, well, that's kind of satisfactory, because after all, that chunk at least resembles the delta xu that we're trying to get at in the first place. A careful student may look ahead a little bit and say, well, that difference can be solved for if we know something about this angle. We can use elementary trigonometric operations to estimate this distance based on this angle and that gives us some notion of what delta x you might be. Well, you might say, well, but yeah, how do we know that angle? That we're prepared to trust because the satellite is so far away that even though its nav message might give minute errors in this angle, they're extremely small. They're small compared to our goal here. So that's our strategy looking forward. I hope it works for you. Next view graph will just provide a little bit more detail. Same situation, true location. Over here, assumed over here. Now we've provided a little bit more detail to those two distances in terms of the measurement. The arguments that appear within the radical are xu, the true location, xu, yu, zu, the true location of the user, xk, yk, zk, not embellished with capital B, meaning the true location of the satellite. The xu0, yu0, zu0, that's the assumed location of the ship. The x super kb, y super kb, z super kb is the broadcast location of the satellite. So this is just an explosion of what goes into the distance measurement um, in the case of the true measurement and our construction. We still have our eye on 
going forward with this strategy of differencing those two things, but now we have a little bit more grist for our mill. And here's the difference that I spoke about. Pseudo range, and here's the assumed. And for fun, sometimes people call the assumed, sometimes they call it the constructed range, or sometimes they call it the theo range, just to be cute, I think. And uh, so that it's a term similar to the pseudo range, but uh, setting aside all of that uh, uh, vocabulary and fun, just bear in mind, one is the actual measurement made by the receiver, and the other is a, a, a pseudo or a, a assumed measurement constructed based on auxiliary information, uh, either based on the assumed location of the ship or the broadcast information from the satellite. And it's getting to be kind of gorgeous now because now we look at, well, this is really what we have in our hand. We've reduced our measurement by the Theo range. And as we look at the geometry, we can begin to appreciate that that difference right there is equal to the delta x u that we seek multiplied by the cosine of the elevation angle. The elevation angle is the height above the horizon that the satellite appears at to the user. So that's well known to the user. Uh, be the user here, over here, or over here at the assumed location or the true location, that angle doesn't change much. In addition, the pseudo range contains the clock offset. So those precious things that we care about, the estimanda, do appear on the right-hand side here. And we're grateful for that. It would be very sad if we made a pseudo range measurement, whether we reduced it or not, if the right-hand side no longer contained or somehow obliterated the estimanda. We really do want the estimanda to affect our measurement, otherwise there's no point in taking the measurement. Now, you may still be concerned. You'd say, look, Professor, you only have the one measurement to the case satellite, and you have two, really three unknowns on the right-hand side. You're not winning this game. You have three unknowns and only one measurement. Uh, how can you even hope to, to solve that set of equations? Well, first of all, I'm going to assume that the elevation angle is well known enough. So I still cheerfully concede that we do have the two unknowns, x, u, b, u, and the one measurement. There is something nice, however. Notice that by this differencing operation, this uh, development of, derivation of this residual difference between pseudo range and the theo range, that both of our estimanda now appear as linear variables in this equation. So delta x u is here just multiplied by a constant, and b u appears with the constant 1 in front of it. So that's been the huge step forward. What are we going to do to seal the deal, however? How are we going to get from here to a system of equations we can solve for? We're just going to bring in another satellite. We are just going to go ahead and expend one more satellite for this purpose. And please just uh, regard the green traces as being pseudo range and theo range to satellite one. And the red traces as being pseudo range and theo range to satellite two. They have slightly different elevation angles. And oh, by the way, they must. If they had the same elevation angles, we wouldn't get the diversity in these equations that we need. It would be a shame, wouldn't it, if the right-hand side of these two equations for the two different satellites was, let's say, a constant 1 half times xu plus bu plus here in this case, once again, a constant 1 half times xu bu. In that case, those equations cannot be solved. The inverse to that linear system of equations does not exist. So we need these elevation angles to be a little bit different, at least a little bit different. By the way, with that, we have foreshadowed the importance of the satellite geometry relative to the user. We really need diversity in the elevation angles. Well, 
my claim to you is we're doing well now. <clears throat> the left-hand side of these equations are just two numbers. They're whatever the uh, pseudo-range measurement was. I don't know what it was, uh, you know, 75 milliseconds, something like that, minus the Theo range, whatever that number is. In the case of satellite one, similarly, we have a number on the left-hand side for satellite two. We know these two elevation angles, so we know the cosine of the two elevation angles. And so then, now, joyfully, happily, we have two equations and two unknowns. Can we generalize this? We've just solved only a, a, a navigation equation in the east-west dimension. We've made it a little bit more complicated because we did include the clock offset, but certainly the reality is a little bit more complicated than this planar problem that we've talked about here. Let's take it one step at a time. Let's include the impact of satellites which are not in the same plane as east-west. In other words, if you can imagine it, think about that plane and then rotate one of the satellites out of that plane. So red and green do not fall on the same plane. Let's say red is pitched backwards a little bit or red is pitched forward a little bit. What do we do about that? <clears throat> what we can do is characterize the line of sight vector from the user up to the satellite as both an elevation angle, elevation angle, remember, is the angle made by that line of sight relative to the horizon. Azimuth is the angle made by that line of sight relative to north. So now we've got two things going for us, elevation up out of the horizontal, and then azimuth as we rotate around this way. Just for simplicity, I've left this problem as a one-dimensional east-west problem with clock, but uh, now things are getting more complicated, more complete, and notice that the azimuth angle enters the problem right here. So xu, delta xu rather, is no longer multiplied just by cosine l. It's multiplied by the product, cosine l, sine as. Similarly, for satellite two, it's cosine L to the second and sine as to the second. Fortunately, the linear form of the equations has not disappeared. <clears throat> By the way, when we talk about navigation east-west and talk about these angles defined as elevation and azimuth relative to the north, we are assuming something different than the Earth-centered, Earth-fixed reference frame that we talked about earlier. We are now using a reference frame called East-North-Up. So we'll return to the subject of reference frames in Module 3, a little bit in our future, but we've foreshadowed it here even in the development of the navigation equations. So please spend a moment thinking about the difference between Earth-centered, Earth-fixed, and East-North-Up or have a look on the web. There's plenty of good information on it. <clears throat> Here's the next step in the generalization. And notice that these cosine sine elements appear as the term that multiplied delta E. And so they're the ones that we derived with our stick figures over the last uh, four or five view graphs. If we now include north and go through a similar analysis, we'll discover that the multiplying terms on a satellite by satellite basis are no longer cosine L sine as, but they're rather cosine L cosine as. If we include up, something that we did not include in our shipborne problem that we've been working, but we should, if we want to include the impact of tides, that would cause that ship to go up and down, then the multiplying factor is not uh, two terms, it's simply sine L. And then finally, here's the clock offset. We did include that in the analysis of the last four view graphs, and the multiplying factor, as you recall, was one. So become friends with these four terms. 
They're very important. This is the description of the line of sight normalized to unity length from the user up to the satellite described in the east-north-up frame. It's a gorgeous vector. It's a function only of where the satellite appears in the sky relative to the user. And as we look down, it just repeats itself for satellite two, three, four, all the way up to capital K. Capital K might be the 10 or nine that we have in view. This matrix is so powerful, so prevalent, it has many names in the detection and estimation community, in the satellite navigation community. Most often, it's called the geometry matrix. Please become friends with it. It is an adorable object. Sometimes it's called the observation matrix. Sometimes it's called the design matrix. It is a function of whether you're working in east-north-up or earth-centered, earth-fixed. And when we're working in east-north-up, what we do in this course is we call it G tilde, just to be clear about uh, the associated reference frame. And so here we've had a little bit of fun. G tilde 1 means the first row of the geometry matrix. And each of those rows multiply the vector of Estimanda. We're just about done. Uh, just one last thought for you, and we'll call it quits for this snippet. Um, one thing that's of importance to us, and I just want to foreshadow something that we'll return to later on, is if you take each of these rows, let's say G tilde 1, and you multiply it by the estimanda, you're getting a thing called the projection. And it is an estimate, a notion of what the pseudo range should be if that estimate of east, north, up, B is applied to the measurement from the first satellite only. That quantity is given here again just to emphasize how important it is, it's called the residual. And sometimes we can call it the innovation. Residual is a great name because it says, gosh, if we have an estimate of east-north-up clock that we believe in, how consonant is it with the measurements from each satellite? How consonant is it with the measurement from the first satellite, the second satellite, the third satellite, all the way up to the Kth satellite? And of course, when we design estimators for GPS to estimate east-north-up clock, we seek maximum consonants.